We've just looked at the heart of the biblical story. The cross and the death of Christ. Now we come to chapter 11 of the book called The Task, because Christ has a task for his church. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. And we will begin reading in verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Christ is going to give his commission to the church. But before he does, he makes an incredible claim, a great claim. And what he says is all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Where is Christ king? He's king of heaven and earth. This is the claim that he is making. But if you ask Christians around the world, where is Jesus king? They'll say, well, he's king of heaven, but he won't be king of earth until he comes back. And from that misguided statement, they decide what the church is, what the task of the church is, and define the church completely from this concept that Jesus is king of heaven but not of earth. But Jesus' claim is that he is king of heaven and of earth. I was in Central Asia a number of years ago in the small country of Kyrgyzstan, and we were doing a conference for about 130, 135 Kyrgyz pastors. And every afternoon we had a time of worship. And on this particular afternoon, I think it was a Wednesday, we were singing, and at the chorus of this particular hymn, there was electricity in the air of the room where we were. Now, I don't know how many of you have been in a situation where you have felt electricity during the worship time. That it was powerful and I was having chills going up and down my spine whenever they came to the chorus of the, of the hymn. And I turned to my translator and I said, what are they singing when they sing the chorus of this hymn? I said, I know it's powerful, but I don't speak Russian, so I don't know what the content is. And he said, they're singing... Emmanuel is coming to Kyrgyzstan. Emmanuel is coming to Kyrgyzstan. Well, these pastors understood something that we often do not understand. Emmanuel is coming to the United States. Emmanuel is coming to Mexico, to Colombia, to Vietnam to Laos, to Uganda, to Sudan, to Nigeria. Emmanuel is coming. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Before Jesus died, the disciples asked him, Jesus teaches how to pray. And Jesus said, okay, pray this way. And what did he teach us? Pray, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. And then what did he say? Pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Christ is king of heaven. 
Heaven is heaven because He reigns perfectly there. His will is done perfectly. This world here that we live in is broken because His word, His will is not done perfectly. But Jesus has conquered death. He is coronated now, King of heaven and earth. And He has a task for His disciples because He wants His kingdom to be extended from heaven to earth. He wants some of heaven to come to earth. And therefore, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore, go. Therefore, go. And do what? Make disciples of all nations. Now before I continue, I need to make a distinction here and make it very clear. We need to make a distinction between what my friend and co-laborer Bob Moffat calls the Greek Commission and the Great Commission. If you ask the average Christian, what is the Great Commission? They'll say it's to go into all the world, preach the gospel, and save souls for heaven. And I'll say, no, that's not the Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? And I'll ask them to read this text, and they'll read it. And, oh, it's to go into all the world, preach the gospel, save souls for heaven, and plant churches. And I'll say, no, that is not the Great Commission. That is the Greek Commission. That is the concept of the Great Commission when we think dualistically that the spiritual realm is more important than all of life. What is the Great Commission? Therefore, go and do what? Make disciples of all nations. And here we find the word nations again. God has a love for the nations. He raised up Abraham to be a blessing to the nations. Now he has raised up his church to do what? To disciple nations. And the Great Commission is nothing less than the discipling of nations. God wants to see the brokenness of nations transformed. And our task is to disciple nations. Now, we cannot do that task without winning people to Christ. And we cannot do that task without planting churches. But we can see people come to Christ and we can plant churches, churches that are full on Sundays, churches that are full on Wednesdays, and still not fulfill the Great Commission. And we're doing that all over the world today. And that is why our nations are so broken. You have a nation like Kenya where 80% of the people in, in Kenya profess Christ. The churches are full morning and night on Sunday. And yet the corruption in Kenya is rampant. Families are broken. The AIDS pandemic is everywhere. Poverty is everywhere. How can this be? The gospel's gone out. People have professed Christ. Churches have been planted but we haven't fulfilled the Great Commission. We have not discipled nations. And that is the task that God has given His church. Nothing less than the discipling of nations. And let me say quite simply, if the church is not discipling the nation, the nation will disciple the church. Let me say that again. If the church is not discipling the nation, the nation will disciple the church. And you can ask the question about your own church. Is it discipling the nation? Do you see the kingdom of God coming into your community? Or do you see the value system of your society dominating the church? Very simple question. 
And our task is nothing less than to disciple nations. Now we come to the end of the story. This is chapter 12 and it's called The Return of the King. At the end of history, Christ is coming back to marry His bride. Turn with me to the book of Revelation. And as we read Revelation 21, verses 23 through 26, I want to ask you a question. What word, hopefully, jumps out at you as we read this passage? Revelation 21, we see in verse 1 and 2 that the, the city of God, the new heaven, the new earth, and the city of God, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven to earth. Now in verses 23 through 26, we find these words. The city does not need the sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. What word do we see more than one time in this passage? It's the word nations. God has a heart for the nations, a love for the nations. And that's why he raised up Abraham to be a blessing to the nations. And he raised up the church to disciple the nations because at the end of history, the kings of the earth, the nations of the earth are going to be ingathered into the city of God. They will be attracted by the light of God, and Christ is that light, is that lamp. Like moths are attracted to a light outside your house in the summertime at night, so the nations will be attracted and be swarming to the city of God. And the kings of the nations will bring something with them to the city. What are they going to bring? They're going to bring the glory and the honor of their nations. They're going to bring, as it were, the artifacts of the creativity of their nations into the city of God as gifts for Jesus Christ on his wedding day. In Genesis 1, we saw that God put the man and the woman on the earth to do something with what God had made, to take it and use it to create things of beauty and things of goodness. We have not always done that well, but there are people who consciously stand before God and say, Lord, help me to take what you have given me and to do something lasting with it, something that honors you with it. And at the end of history, those things will be taken as gifts by the kings of the earth to Christ on his wedding day. And now we come to the end of the story. It begins in Genesis and ends in Revelation. It begins in a garden and ends in a city. It's a story that has the ability to transform individual lives to lift communities out of poverty, and to build nations that are free, just, and compassionate. But we have a problem. The church in our generation and our parents' generation have not been telling the whole story. What we have done is taken chapter 10 and we have ripped it out of the book and thrown the book away. And we've said chapter 10 is the whole story. Chapter 10 is not the whole story. The Bible does not begin with John 3.16. Where does it begin? It begins in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. 
but the church is not telling the whole story. But what we're doing, we are taking chapter 10 of the book and putting it in somebody else's story. Here in the United States, we've taken the glorious Gospels and we've put them into a materialistic storyline. And we've said, come to Christ and God will bless you. Come to Christ and God will give you things. You're a child of the King and the King wants you to have everything you want. Pray and God will give you a better car. Pray and God will give you a bigger house. You give God $10, he'll give you $100 back. What is this? It's crass materialism. And we've taken the precious Gospels and we've put them into a materialistic story. And we've done this all over the world. In India, we've taken the precious Gospels and we've put it into a Hindu story. In Korea, we've taken the precious Gospels and we've put it into a Confucian story. In Africa, we've taken the precious Gospels and we've put them into an animistic story. We have not been telling the whole story. May I have my book, please? Thank you. We need to be people of the book. We need to take the Gospels and put them back in the book. This book is not just any story. This book is not a made up story. This book is the story. It's God's story. And it helps us understand truth. It helps us understand what is good and what is beautiful. This book comports with reality. And nation after nation is suffering. Even nations that have been evangelized and had churches planted, they're suffering corruption, decay, disease, poverty, because we have not told the whole story. I'd like you to reflect for a few minutes. What are you hearing? Not just what are you hearing with your ears, but is God speaking to your heart? And what are you hearing Him say? And I want you to ask another question. How are you, or how is your church, not telling the whole story? What are you leaving out?